Hi everyone, welcome back to another lesson. We're talking about a condition known as exploding head syndrome in this lesson. So we're going to talk about what this condition is, some proposed hypotheses as to why it occurs. We'll also talk about some signs and symptoms, some associated medical conditions that may be triggering this condition. And we'll also talk about the way it's diagnosed and treated. So exploding head syndrome is a parasomnia disorder. So parasomnia disorders are going to be sleep disorders that involve generally behaviors or anything that might disrupt sleep. Now, exploding head syndrome is more specifically a sleep condition involving the triggering of sensory stimuli when falling asleep, which would be hypnagogic effects. So anything that happens when we're falling asleep is considered hypnagogic, and when waking up, or what we would call hypnopompic effects. So you can remember the difference between these two terms by hypnagogic going to sleep and waking up, hypnopompic pumping up. So it's going to occur when first falling asleep or waking up. It can either be when waking up in the morning or waking up throughout the night. Some of these sensory stimuli can be things like explosions, popping sounds, and other loud noises. We'll discuss this in more detail when we talk about the signs and symptoms. Now, it's important to point out that exploding head syndrome is a benign condition. A lot of times, individuals can be very worried by the sounds they can hear when they're falling asleep or waking up, and they may feel that perhaps they have some mental health issue or they have some tumor or have some kind of stroke, but this is actually a benign condition, so it's very important to point that out. Now, this condition is frequently misdiagnosed some clinicians may not have heard of it, or it's underdiagnosed simply because a patient doesn't want to come forward and tell their clinician about it. Again, due to some of those fears of, oh, perhaps they have some mental health condition that they don't want to talk about, or they're worried that they might have. Now, the epidemiological data for exploding head syndrome is somewhat lacking. We don't know a lot about who gets this particular condition. We will talk about some of the triggers and some of the potential reasons for getting this later, but what kind of patient gets this, we're not entirely sure. We do know that it's likely that females may be more susceptible to this than males. There has been a study showing that 16% of college students have had this particular condition at some point, and also this condition is more likely to occur in those with sleep paralysis. The connection is not entirely clear, but one study shows that around 37% of individuals who have sleep paralysis have had at least one episode of exploding head syndrome. So now let's talk about some of the proposed hypotheses for why some individuals get exploding head syndrome and hear those loud banging noises when they're falling asleep or waking up. So we first have to discuss some brief information about the different stages of sleep. So when you're first falling asleep, you're into stage one. This is where there are alpha waves, and then there's some shifting into what we call theta waves. This will be important here in a moment. Then you go into stage two. This is predominated by theta waves, sleep spindles, K complexes, and then we can go into stage three and four. This is, would be considered deep sleep. So this is also known as slow wave sleep, and we get delta waves in this particular stage of sleep. And then the next stage would be stage two, and then into rapid eye movement, or where we would have that narrative-like dream scenarios that we would have. So what's key with regards to one of the hypotheses as to why exploding head syndrome may occur is there is some issue, again, in stage one. It's about perhaps falling asleep first. So we have to first talk about some of the lobes of the brain. Here's the frontal lobe, here's the temporal lobe, here's the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And what we generally see is that when individuals are falling asleep, or even when they start closing their eyes, they can enter into alpha waves. And then in stage one, there's a shift from alpha to theta. And we're going to see generally more alpha waves in the occipital lobe. This is the lobe that has to do with visual processing. In the parietal lobe, one of the hypotheses, and there's some evidence here to show that this does occur in some of these patients, that in the parietal lobe, and perhaps in the temporal lobe as well, that there's some issue with the shift from alpha to theta. So what's generally supposed to happen is that you're going to see more of a shift from alpha to theta waves occurring first in the parietal and temporal lobes and then later into the occipital lobe. But in some patients, it has been shown that there are issues with this transition from alpha to theta, especially in the parietal and temporal lobes. And this is one hypothesis as to why there may be these loud banging, popping noises when falling asleep. Now, another potential hypothesis is that there's some issue in the brainstem. 
more specifically in the pons and what we would call the reticular formation. So the reticular formation is involved in waking up and there's going to be a shift in reticular formation activity when we're falling asleep. So one hypothesis is that there is abnormal sensory shutting off or gating. So when falling asleep, the reticular formation is going to, or supposed to help dampen sensory input. So there is some hypothesis as to perhaps there's some issue with reticular formation activity, and that's leading to these loud popping and banging sounds when falling asleep or when waking up. Another potential hypothesis is that there's some issue with the serotonergic system. Now the serotonin system is going to originate from a nucleus called the dorsal raphi nucleus. So the dorsal raphi nucleus is going to be where serotonergic neurons sprout out and essentially bathe the brain. So in sleep there are changes in serotonin functioning. And one hypothesis is that there is some dysregulation of the dorsal raphi nucleus, that serotonergic hub. And the reason that this is hypothesized is because of the fact that some antidepressants can help with regards to symptoms. We'll talk about that when we talk about treatment. And then along with this, there are other hypotheses suggesting that there's maybe some issue with calcium signaling because we can see some calcium channel inhibitors working and helping symptoms as well. Again, we'll discuss that when we talk about treatment. And there's also the hypothesis that perhaps the issue is occurring in the ear itself. So there is a less supported hypothesis that perhaps there's some issue in the middle ear when patients are falling asleep or waking up. But again, this is a less supported hypothesis. The other hypotheses are more likely to be the reason for this condition. Now, what are some of the signs and symptoms and other clinical features in exploding head syndrome? So this condition is going to have a sudden onset. So the symptoms are going to occur suddenly when you're falling asleep. It's going to have these sudden banging, loud noises. The loud noises are going to be anything. Some describe them like gunshots, some like fireworks, some like thunder, or some explosion. Some individuals can even have a feeling or an explosion-like sensation. So it might not even be the sound, but they can just feel like there's something almost like an explosion sensation in their head. Importantly, this is going to be painless. So that's going to be key when we talk about the diagnosis. And then patients are going to be awakened suddenly, abruptly, in fear and panic, simply because, well, it sounds like something very loud, bang, just happened. So you're going to be startled and awoken. Now, the duration of these sounds are usually going to be only a few seconds. Sometimes it can only be one second. So it could just be within one second, you get this banging and then you're going to wake up and you're going to wonder what happened, but it was actually exploding head syndrome. And then some patients can have visual hallucinations. So they can see flashes of light or pops of light. So even when they're sleeping, they hear these bangs and then they can see a flash of light. So that can also occur in some patients. Now, what are some of the potential triggers and associated conditions with exploding head syndrome. So one big one is going to be sleep deprivation. We see this more occurring in patients who haven't had good sleep for a long period of time, or even if they, if especially if they're susceptible, if they haven't had a good sleep even the night prior, they're more likely to have these banging sounds when they go to sleep. Poor sleep hygiene is also related to this as well. So perhaps they are not sleeping at consistent times. They don't have consistent sleep schedules, perhaps they look at screens right before they go to sleep. Some of these can increase the risk for having this occur. And then stress is also another big one. So a lot of times these individuals can be going through something in life, they can be very, very stressed, and then they're more likely to have this occurring when they're falling asleep or waking up. And a lot of times, as mentioned before, patients can become quite frightened by this, and this can also trigger stress as well. So either because they may think they have another health condition that is malignant, maybe they think they've had a stroke, or they're having some mental health issue, that can also lead to stressful situations as well. So this condition can essentially feed itself. Now, also interestingly, this is going to more likely occur when lying down or sleeping supine or lying on your back flat. So this is similar to sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis is more likely to occur when you're lying down flat on your back as well. And then there are some other evidence showing that there are associated conditions or some conditions that may also trigger or increase the risk for having exploding head syndrome. Some of these include having migraine with aura, 
having a sudden discontinuation of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or benzodiazepines, having iron deficiency anemia. We do know that there are changes in the brain from iron deficiency that can also lead to things like restless leg syndrome and then another associated condition with sick sinus syndrome. So all these conditions have been associated with at least increasing the risk of having exploding head syndrome. And in these particular cases, when these particular conditions were treated appropriately, exploding head syndrome was reduced or was also itself treated. So it resolved in patients in half exploding head syndrome in the future. So that's also important to point out here. Now let's talk about how this condition is diagnosed. So there is a particular diagnostic criteria for diagnosing exploding head syndrome. So we're going to use International Classification for Sleep Disorders, ICSD-3. So there's gonna be three criteria. One is that there's a sudden perception of a loud noise or explosive sensation in the head, which occurs during the transition from wakefulness to sleep or upon awakening during the night. We talked about that. It's going to occur when falling asleep, when waking up, the loud noise or even that explosion-like sensation in the head. Two, there's an abrupt arousal following the event. Patients wake up abruptly and are very afraid, so it's going to be accompanied by a sense of fear or distress. And three, the experience is not associated with significant pain. This is also critical. It's going to be painless. If there is pain involved, we're going to want to think about a secondary headache. We're going to want to think about some other condition that may be causing these symptoms. The treatment is going to often be patient education and reassurance. Again, a lot of times this condition is making individuals more stressed, more worried, and then they're more likely to have it. So even educating them, telling them that this is a benign condition can help to reassure them and also help reduce the chances that they can have it in the future. Sleep hygiene, we talked about the fact that sleep deprivation, having poor sleep hygiene can also worsen or increase the risk that a patient has it. Stress management can also be important. So cognitive behavioral therapy has also been shown to be helpful. And then there are some pharmacological treatments that have been shown to help in some patients, including TCA antidepressants like clomipramine, amitriptyline, topiramate may also be used, selective norepinephrine reptake inhibitors like duloxetine, nifedipine is a calcium channel blocker. As we talked about before, there's a hypothesis that there is some issue with calcium channel signaling, and then clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine. I hope you found this lesson helpful. Please consider joining as a member for members-only content, and if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.